So we are entering into, or we have entered into um, already, what is traditionally known as the season of Advent. The season of Advent. And Advent isn't something we really emphasise much um, historically as, as Protestants. But it is something that's always been a feature um, of church history. Um, I'm quite boring, I quite enjoy historical dates and things. Um, but the origins of Advent are unclear. But it looks as though Advent comes from about 480 AD. And in AD 567, that's the first we read about Advent in church history. And the Council of Tours um, prescribed that monks should fast um, one day a month, every, every, day, um, every day in December until Christmas. That was the first we read about Advent, really, in church history, um, in about 567. But obviously today there are lots of different ways of marking Advent. I was quite stunned recently when I, I was looking at some of the Advent calendars that are on display. And uh, if you want to now, you can buy um, an Advent calendar with Prosecco. So you can have an Advent calendar with Prosecco every day. Or for the ladies among you, um, you can buy an Advent calendar with a makeup set every day, if you want to do that. Um, so, so really, Advent is, is becoming... I mean, you know, those things are great, aren't they? But in a sense, <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a sense, it's becoming... The consumerism of Christmas really is starting early, isn't it? You know, there's nothing wrong. If you want to have a Prosecco advent calendar, you're absolutely welcome to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is a sign, isn't it, that in a sense, advent is becoming, um, is becoming Christmas earlier. It's becoming the consumerism, the big festival of consumerism that Christmas is, it's starting earlier. So now it lasts through the whole of December. So, but the church, the Christian church, historically, has always seen Advent as a time of preparation, a time of getting ready for Jesus, particularly Jesus, the baby at Bethlehem, but also for the Jesus who offers himself to us every day, and also getting ready now for Jesus who will come again in glory at his second coming. So it's this time of preparation, this time of waiting, this time of anticipation. So today is the first really of three Christmas themes and I've been given, I've been assigned um, preparing for the King, preparing for Jesus. And as I was looking at this, I really wanted to, or I felt the Lord was leading me to this particular passage um, in Matthew because John, above all, John the Baptist was the forerunner. He was the, it says in Isaiah that he was prophesied to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his way straight. Now, in the ancient world, um, when a king um, was travelling from place to place, they used to send a messenger ahead of them. And what the messenger would do is his job would be to scout out the route, to look for all the potholes and all the uneven places in the road, so that the king could then travel um, unimpeded on his way. And that is what John the Baptist was doing. He's preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. Preparing that smooth way for the coming of Jesus. So I'm going to keep it, you know, hopefully fairly brief and to the point. But I want to look at, and you can follow above me, you can follow... Um, in your handouts, um, but I want to just focus on a few specific things about preparing for the King, about preparing for Jesus. And the first thing I want to talk about is we need to prepare for King Jesus by a radical repentance, by a radical repentance. If you notice in verse 2, the very first word out of John's lips is this word, repent. Mm. Repent. Now, not only is repent the first word out of John's lips, but it's also the first word of Jesus' gospel. Mm. 
because Jesus says, should be on the screen above me, it says, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching, that the gospel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. But we see this theme of repentance being a key part of the gospel is not only in what Jesus says, it's not only in what John says, but it's also in the very first Christian sermon that we see. That sermon that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost. Because Peter said to them, he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you remember Paul, you remember the Apostle Paul, when he was hauled up in front of Agrippa, King Agrippa, and Paul was trying to give a summary to Agrippa of what his gospel, what his message was about. And Paul says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and in Judea, sorry, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. So a key element of the gospel. In fact, that is one of the ways that we can know that the authentic gospel is being, um, is being delivered if we're at a crusade or an evangelistic event, because repentance was so key to every time the gospel was presented in the Bible, we know that repentance is an essential part of the gospel. But what we need to understand, if we're going to understand that, is we need to understand what does it mean to repent? What does the word repent mean? One of the things that we're very conscious of as a leadership is that we're always using jargon. We use a lot of jargon in the church. And if you're not from the church, and I hope that there are some of you here today who are not from a Christian background, you start to wonder, what on earth are you talking about? Repent. It's not a word we normally use. Well, the word repent is actually a Greek word. It's actually a Greek word, the word used in the New Testament. And it's this word, metanoia. Metanoia. Now, what, have, have you ever heard the word meta before in any other context? Yes, a hand up there. <laughs> Do you want to say what it is? Do you remember? Meta-data. Yes, that's right, an explanation. Metatag, yes. And, um, and another one is something like metamorphosis. Have you heard the word metamorphosis? So really metamorphosis, it has to do with this idea of change. So the word meta means change. And the word noia means perception. The word noia means perception. So meta noia, it means a change in your perception. Or more, si <clears throat> more simply, it means a change of mind changing your mind changing your mind and and we as christians we're saying it means changing our mind about ourselves about sin about god about the whole world a change of mind metanoia but in the new testament it carries the word the word repent carries an even more radical meaning because it also means a radical reorientation of our lives away from sin and towards god it's an about turn a three, you know, 180 degree turn from our sin towards God, metanoia. But I just want to talk about what is it that we're repenting from? What is it that, that John calls us to repent from? What is it that Jesus calls it, us to repent from? In fact, what is sin? What is sin? Well, the Bible says that sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is breaking the law. And Jesus told us that the two greatest commandments are to love God with everything that we have and to love our neighbour as much as we love ourselves. So in other words, to give we naturally prefer ourselves, it's to give a preferential love to others, to love God with everything we are, a wholehearted 
passionate, devoted love with everything in our being, everything, all of the fibers of our being to love God in that way and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so if sin is lawlessness, sin is basically breaking those two commands. It's breaking those two commands. So this is what John called the, um, the Galileans to, um, sorry, the Judeans here. It's what he called them to, towards repentance. Towards repentance. But I just want to say a few more things. Because repentance is so important, because repentance is really the heart of our faith, it's the heart of the gospel. I want to talk a bit more about repentance this morning. So first of all, um, repentance is a lifestyle. It's not just a one-off decision. So you may think that you've repented because you know, you've just raised your hand at a crusade or um, you've come forward to the front of a church. You may think that that is repentance. But repentance is not just a one-off decision. Repentance is an entire way of life. And uh, if we look at verse 4, we see that John, he really oozed repentance. Everything that John did we see his attire, the strange way he was addressed. He even ate locusts for his diet. Can you imagine that? But, but John was someone who didn't live in the lap of luxury, but his whole life was one of repentance, an entire life of repentance. We see that in, in, in John. Do you remember recently we were looking at the Reformation? Do you remember we looked at the Reformation and we saw that little Playmobil thing above and uh, all the the kind of um, figures that were there? And we saw one of the figures, the key star figure of the Reformation was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, the very first, do you remember he he sort of, um, he had his bit of paper with his 95 um, kind of complaints against the Church of Rome at the time, um, which, as legend have it, had it, he nailed on the door at Wittenberg. Well, the very first of those um, theses that he nailed to that church door at Wittenberg, the very first of them was this. He said, when our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. The entire life of believers to be one of repentance. But secondly, true repentance is marked by a deep awareness of our sin. It's marked by an awareness of our sin. Because if we look in verse 6, we see that these people were baptised by John and then they confessed their sins. They confessed their sins. They recognised that they were in the wrong and that God was in the right and that the way they'd been living was wrong. So they confessed their sins. And in fact, this is something that we see repeatedly throughout the Bible and in the Psalms. It's impossible for us to have an encounter with this God. It's impossible for us to have an encounter with the God of the Bible without having a deep awareness of our sin. If we look at um, one of the Beatitudes that Jesus said, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will see God. So if we have this sense of our own spiritual poverty, our own spiritual bankruptcy, that's when we get to see God. That's when we get to see who God is. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In spirit, this awareness of sin, that's what repentance is. And if we look in verse 7, the third thing I want to say about repentance is that true repentance can look superficially different, but it's also fundamentally the same. We come across these two groups of people in verse 7. We see the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they come, they flock to John. They come to John's baptism. These two groups of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now if you're students of the Bible, you'll know a lot about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But they were two very different groups of people at the time. And they were different demographically. And they were also different theologically. So the Sadducees, they were really the aristocrats of the time. They were the wealthy aristocrats. 
whereas the Pharisees were, were kind of middle-class businessmen more. So they were different stratas of society, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But not only were they different stratas of society, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but they were different theologically. So the Pharisees were the theological conservatives. If you like, they in some ways, I hope, I hope we're not Pharisees, but in some ways they were like the evangelicals of their day um, because they believed everything that the Bible said. They took the Bible very literally. The problem was that the Pharisees had also added a lot of um, traditions and a lot of extra commandments um, to that. Now the Sadducees, they were different theologically in that they were the liberals of the day. They were the rationalists of the day. So they denied, we know from later on in the Bible, that they denied things like the resurrection, they denied the miraculous. Um, they were very much the liberals of the day. So you have these two groups of people. And on the outside, they look very, very different. But what's interesting is you find that despite the differences, their root sin was the same. The root sin of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was actually the same. And we know what that was from scriptures like Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. It says, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. So their root sin, which was the love of praise, the love of man, was actually the same even though, in many ways, they were very different. But we can also learn a lesson from that. Because all of us struggle with, with different sins. So for some of us, our issue is that we tend to get very angry and we fly off the handle very easily. And so repentance for that person, for the angry and irritable person, when they repent, their repentance looks like them becoming more peaceable and gentle. But other people don't want to offend anybody. And their issue that they're dealing with is the fear of man. So for, the, for that person to repent, you may actually find that they become more direct and more straightforward. So what I'm trying to say is that repentance looks different for different people. And we shouldn't be dogmatic about what that looks like. As long as people's lives are being reorientated, as long as they're being changed towards God, then repentance will look very different for different people. So that's the third thing to say about repentance. But also finally, I think about repentance, verses 8 to 10. It says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not say to ourselves, We have Abraham as our father. This idea in verse 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. That repentance is always evidenced by fruit. If you haven't got any fruit of repentance in your lives, you have to question, have I really met with Jesus at all? You have to seriously say, have I ever met with this God? If there is not one if your life is not going in a trajectory towards loving God and towards loving your neighbour, you have to seriously examine yourself and say, have I met with God? Have I met with Jesus? Because there's such a thing as, there is such a thing as easy believism. There's such a thing as thinking that you've made a commitment thinking that you've made a commitment, but if there's no evidence of that in your life, you have to examine yourselves. True repentance bears fruit worthy of repentance. It's very, very clear. But what are the fruit of repentance briefly? Do you remember earlier we talked about what sin was and we said that sin is lawlessness? Well, in a sense, repentance looks like lawfulness. Repentance is when we begin to fill, fulfill the laws of God. We start to actually begin to fulfill those laws. And so in a sense, the fruit of repentance is love. It's beginning to fulfill those two commands that we learned about earlier. And it says in, it paints this beautiful picture in, in Galatians 5 and verse 22. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then it says, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So, so that's, really, that's really repentance. But secondly, and a bit more briefly, I want to say we need to prepare for the king by pointing beyond ourselves. We need to prepare for King Jesus by pointing beyond ourselves. So John knew that he wasn't the good news. And do we know that we are not the good news? And what is the message that we share with people? What's the message that we're hoping to get out on the street outreach? Is it come to our church? Is it, you know, be like, be like us? Be like Joe, be like John, <laughs> be like Adam, be like us, come and join us, be like us, come to our church. I was listening to something, I, I read a quote from something that a Christian leader had said, and um, I thought it was quite interesting. He said, I know what he means as well, by the way, so I'm not condemning him, but it's quite interesting. He was saying, the local church is the hope of the world, and its future rests primarily in the hands of its leaders. The local church is the hope of the world and its future rests primarily in the hands of its leaders. And I read that and I thought, oh dear. <laughs> because you know, isn't the truth that Jesus is the hope of the world? Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world. And we sing that, don't we? That Jesus is the hope of the world. It's not us. It's not us. It's definitely not us as leaders, oh no. But it's Jesus, Jesus is the hope of the world. And you know, um, and you know like, like, um, like John really, we're just humble messengers of the King. We're humble messengers of King Jesus, going out to prepare the way, make his way straight. You know, actually we're more like, you know, the church that Jesus writes to in Revelation. And he says, because you say I'm rich, because you say I've become wealthy and have need of nothing, do you not know that, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked? And if we're honest, that's how we all come to God. We all come with an empty hand to God. We don't come with anything to offer to him. But we point to Jesus because he's the one who's coming. He's the one who baptises with the Holy Spirit. He's the one who baptises with fire. He's the hope. He's the hope of the world, Jesus. Um, but you know, I think that there's some interesting um, kind of... Uh, implications of this because you know it's very easy when you're doing outreach particularly at this time of the year we're doing our outreach and this is our church's outreach and we're getting behind our outreach but I'm really challenged by this idea that lots of other churches in the city are doing outreach lots of other gospel believing churches are doing outreach and lots of other churches are proclaiming Jesus as the hope of the world but how do we in this church react when other churches are proclaiming Jesus is the hope of the world? Is there some jealousy there, perhaps? Would we rather that, that, of course we want them to come and join us, but would we rather that they came and joined us? Is it more about our church, about expanding our club? Or actually, are we just happy that the name of Jesus is being glorified and that other people are coming to him? And that's one of the things I want to say. I think it's important for us to mature in that. Because there are other churches outside this one who are pointing to Jesus. And actually part of recognising that we are not the good news is that actually we're happy whenever the good news is proclaimed by anyone who believes that good news. Amen. Amen. So I hope that we're not jealous or, you know, we don't get kind of put out if someone, you know, even if they go to Surrey Chapel, well, hey, <laughs> you know, um, whatever the reason. Or even if someone comes past our choir and they hear those words of the gospel, the, the, the rich theology and the beautiful invitation that there is in those gospel. And maybe they don't come from this area at all. Maybe they're going to go back to somewhere like Scotland where Lisa Rose comes from or, or somewhere else in the world. But that doesn't matter because if they've met with Jesus through that, then we shouldn't care really whether they come back here or not as long as they meet with him. But of course we want people to come here and be disciples, but really it's more about Jesus. It's more about him. But finally, really, and I want, to, I want to end on this. It is a slightly more heavy note, but I think it is a note that needs to be sounded, particularly in these, these times. 
Um, the first thing is, you know, we prepare for the king by this radical repentance. We, we prepare for the king by pointing beyond ourselves to Jesus. Um, but finally, we do prepare for the king by warning of the wrath to come. We prepare for the king by warning of the wrath to come. And why do I say that? That's because that's what John did. I mean, John had some quite harsh words here, didn't he? He said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then what does he say in verse 10? He says, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And even if you look at this idea of Jesus coming as the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and the one who baptizes with fire, well, fire does two things. It purges and it purifies those who are believers, but also it burns up the chaff. It burns up those who have not responded. And actually, John goes on to talk about this in verse 12. He says that when Jesus comes, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What they used to do in those times in, in, in the agriculture of the day is they would have a big, huge, what, they call, what he's saying here is a winnowing fan, or a bit like a large fork, really. And um, they'd have all of the, I don't suppose it's wheat, isn't it, really? <laughs> That they cut from the uh, that they cut from the from the fields, and they put it all in this winnowing fan, and then they would toss it up, and the heavy grain would fall to the floor, and the grain was the part that you would want to keep, and the chaff, because it was lighter, it would be blown away, and it would blow off to another part of the threshing floor. And then after the chaff had blown to the threshing floor, they would, someone would come along and they would sweep up the chaff and they would burn it and they would destroy it in that way. Because Christmas is thought of as a cosy time of the year, and it is. We all love the picture, card post, the picture postcards of, of, of Christmas. But I think partly, if we're to have a sense of mission... We need to have a sense of urgency that actually these are life and death matters and that actually there is a wrath to come and that actually the chaff will be burnt in the fire and that actually we need to wake up and we need to take our responsibility seriously to reach out to the lost. And we don't often think in those terms especially these days as Christians, but there is a responsibility on us because of the stakes. If we really believe what we say we believe, there needs to be an urgency to reach people with this gospel because they will be the chaff. They will be the ones who will be burnt, burnt, um, burnt in the end. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because in a sense, Jesus does come to bring peace. He is the Prince of Peace. The angels do sing glory to God in the highest and peace um, on the earth on, you know, to those on whom his favour rests. We know we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But what does Jesus also say? He says, do not think I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So, so as much as there's a warm invitation in the gospel... There's also a warning. And in some ways it's the warning that gives us the urgency to have a mission, to reach people. If you think of all of the missionaries of old when the great missionary age of the church was, with people like Hudson Taylor and C.T. Studd, and how they left everything to embark on very dangerous voyages to go from this country to other nations, often at risk of their lives, um, you know, braving all the perils of the sea, all the perils of diseases, they went because they knew that there was a wrath to come. They went, went because they knew that people were lost without this message. And in as far as we've lost this urgency, and in as, in as far as we omit judgment from our messages, <laughs> 
You know, as a church, as the church in the West, as much as we've done this, we've lost the urgency because it's life and death. You know, it wasn't only, G- it wasn't only John, you know, who, who preached these heavy messages. Jesus said the same. Jesus said in Luke 13, he says, I tell you, do you remember when the tower had fallen on all the people and there was this terrible tragedy and all these people had died because a a tower had fallen on them? It was probably the equivalent of a tsunami at that time. It was a terrible thing, very tragic. But Jesus said to the disciples, he said, I tell you, unless you repent, you too will perish. Unless you repent, you too will perish. You know, so it gives us an urgency to wake up. You know, church is not just a comfortable social club. It's not just gathering with like-minded people. It's not just hearing a nice, warm, encouraging message. It's not just having good coffee, although we love coffee. Um, but it is, it is, it is, it is an eternal, eternal destinies are at stake. They are at stake. And we need to regain a sense of that. I believe the Lord would say we need to regain a sense of that. You know, I'm really, I'm really struck. This is a very hard passage, but I do believe, you know, just above me, Ezekiel. And, and God, says, God says to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel was someone who was tasked with giving God's message. I mean, we're not Ezekiel, I appreciate, but we are those who are tasked with giving God's message. And God says to Ezekiel, he says these words, and listen to what he says. He says, When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his ways. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But listen to what he says. He says, his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. So we have this responsibility. It doesn't save us. I'm not saying if we don't fulfill this responsibility, we're saved by grace. We're not like Jehovah's Witnesses. But we do have a responsibility. And just because God's sovereign, that doesn't mean that he's going to do it without us. We are his instruments, the instruments that he's appointed. And that blood rests on our hands if we don't obey. And Paul, you know, Paul was someone who preached the gospel. He preached the gospel with all aspects, all facets. The love of God, there's nothing like the love of God. The love of Jesus. Is there any love like the love of Jesus? No love. That invitation, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Never drive away. God loves you and we can say that. And Jesus died for you.